Agito continues his account from the eyes of a journalist. A large crowd had gathered outside the Express, came into the Express with not given fair coverage, and somebody picked up a bottle, stole, and they started to stole the Express. Lou Jones responds to Kenneth Luke. Indeed. It looks for closure, so I'm sorry for him. I have nothing to apologize to him for. I spoke the truth about his father. And the final word goes to David Brazan, who, for the very first time, speaks about his love and respect for Rafik Shah. I was very grateful to Rafik. I didn't know he was Indian. It's only when Pandey made a reference to the Macaram that I say, but wait a minute, I didn't know that. He was just a comrade to me. So join us this Sunday from 6.15 p.m. and live on the Eye on Dependency Facebook page to witness the parade of the retired military personnel who made this series a resounding success. Eye on Dependency, where every life is a biography, is sponsored by the Counter Trafficking Unit, Ministry of National Security. Don't miss it. This is Eye on Dependency with Garth and Natasha. Sundays at 6.15 p.m. on the most influential name in radio, I-95.5 FM. Trinidad and Tobago, and welcome to Eye Independency, right here on I-95.5 FM and live on our Facebook page, I on Dependency. So you just find I Independency on Facebook, click live, and you're inside. Good evening, Natasha. Good evening, Garth. Good evening, Trinidad and Tobago, and welcome to the final episode of this series on the 1970 military mutiny. Yes, welcome. Well, in the, the first season, I should say, because we have season two. We have and also, more stuff for you. We have more oh. stuff for you, and there are people who we will we will deal with in um, season two. My Pepe and the guys, and of course, the freedom fighters. So, we have lots coming up for you. We'll tell you about it as the show goes on. Um, but we're really happy to be here with you this evening, and we have a very, very important closure for you. Um, it's going to be a... A nice innings. Um, we're going to hear from Alfred Aguito, Natasha. Yes, Alfred is going to give us an account of his interaction with the soldiers down at the base. Essentially, he is telling his side of the story of how he covered the mutiny um, and uh, the soldiers that he interacted with and so on. So he's, he's going to give us that side of it. Yes, and also we will hear from Lou Jones, uh, from all indications, a much anticipated response, and I will give my take on it. As when you hear Lou, um, this is a response to Kenneth Luke, and some of you who were aggrieved that we cut off Kenneth when he called the program in episode one, um, in episode two, actually, you all felt we, we didn't give him enough chance. We gave him enough chance to say what he had to say, and some of you had a problem with it. Well, as usual, we cannot please Trin Trinbegonians, we understand that. Uh, but Blue Jones felt he needed to respond and we have given him the opportunity to do so and uh, we hope you all afterwards when you listen to him with an open mind you will understand where all this went and where it's going eventually good evening to Leon, Bianca, Anthony, Anne-Marie and Judy all of you and, and Mr. Landy good evening thank you all very much for joining us on Facebook um, then we'll hear from David Brizan. David Brizan, who was the gentleman who you heard mentioned by Major General Ralph Brown, who was recalled from a course on Canada to return to Trinidad, only to be arrested for a letter that he wrote to Rex LaSalle. And you will hear from him about, about that letter and about his relationship that he developed with Rafik Shah. And this, because this is the first time he's speaking on radio or anywhere else, we are very grateful for him 
taking our call and agreeing to, to go on record with um, what he had to say. And having the last say for this um, series. And of giving sorts. him the last say yes. on this series. Uh, good evening to Carlos, um, Roger Mohamed, and we thank we. Uh, I, can't, I can't answer about Natalie. Um, you had a call. Somebody is here and asked about that. Sorry, I couldn't help you there. Bodyguard, but um, as I said, we'll have your dad in the next season, which should be not too far from now. Um, then we have to touch a little bit on 1990 as well. In between, we have to stick to our moments, which is next. We'll be speaking on grooming with the director of the corner trafficking unit, Mrs. Alana Wheeler. You don't want to miss that either because once you have children, grandchildren, you need to know about this thing called grooming. But today, um, and as we do that, we'll also have a parade. We'll speak after we speak with Mr. Brizan. We we'll call Mr. Rafik Shah also to speak with him for a brief bit. And um, another fitting way for us to wrap up this, seeing that he's the man caused all this in the first place, he and Rex LaSalle. So, <laughs> <laughs> and yes, Bassi he and Brizan. And he's going to take us home, yes. Yes, so. And give his comments, we hope, on, on what we have done on this series and. Hopefully, um, give us a nice uh, send-off, a nice little round of applause, a salute. But what, what do military men do to commend others? Just say bravo Zulu, guys. Bravo Zulu, right. Um, and also, we'll have this usual parade on Facebook. Remember, we're showing our ads now when we take a break, so you can tune in there and see. We have ads from the corner traffic unit that you must see as well, so make sure and log on to Facebook for that. And we'll have a parade of the people who participated in this series so we got their pictures we call them we asked them to send a headshot of them in kit most of them sent sent us some Applied, pictures yes <laughs> and also there were those who we didn't have to ask because they they had photos and lots of books and all of that so you're going to see the coast guard past coast guard commanders and the past um, regiment commanding officers and, and that famous the... that famous gentleman Mr. Spencer. Yes. <laughs> Major Spencer. Who, I and think that must be a record, you know. He is yes. the, the one person who everyone, I think every single person that we have spoken to mentioned him in some way or other. Right. And going forward, we will be asking questions from this series. To, maybe you have tickets to win now to visit the Shagramas Museum. So, all of that, at least you see how, how much you, you would have learned from this series. So, Without further ado, um, again, we start with journalist Alfred Agito, who will be wrapping up this part of the, from the eyes of a journalist. And he made his way to Tetron. He found himself in Tetron Barracks uh, to speak with the, with the mutineers. You know, that was a privilege afforded to, to no other journalist but him and you'll hear who accompanied him and all of that. So, good evening to Marlon Telesford and all of you the, the, who commented on Facebook during the week here generated a nice discussion as usual and we thank you for that we still have some nicknames from the regiment to share with you and a whole lot more so natasha without further ado let's start with mr alfred agito as he describes downtown port of spain what it was like until he got back to the newsroom and what the next assignment was let's go to work. I'm going in to read the 7 o'clock news and I'm crossing Park it's in St. Vincent Street and listening to the radio and I hear the news. This is around 6 I was on the road. So I get into the station and I say, oh wait, what's happening? Where's this announcement coming from? And so I say, yes, it's official. Prime Minister's office sent it out. State of emergency declared. All kinds of restrictions and curfew imposed. You have to have a curfew pass to move around. But while I was in the newsroom, getting accustomed to this, we got word that some disturbances were breaking out across Port of Spain. So we took off and we got as far as Independence Square, opposite the express building, on the northern side, outside a Syrian-owned gentleman's fashion store called Habib's. A large crowd had gathered outside the express, claiming that the express was not given fair coverage. And somebody picked up bottles, stone, and they started to stone the express. The express building front was made of glass and the glass started to shatter. And you know, the sound of breaking glass with a crowd seems to always inflame the crowd more. So more people joined and they started to run west. 
and they were pelting stones and bottles and smashing different business places as they went. But they were anti-business generally. Well, I decided that that was time to get out of the way very quickly. One for safety, two to go back to the station and start reporting on what was happening. Because one of the things I heard at least one woman in the crowd saying, the army break out, the army will we. And that was a chant that was picked up. That was a response to the rumor that when the state of emergency was declared, the army started to head for Port of Spain. So I'm getting ahead of this crazy crowd. And as I swing up Abercrombie Street to head back to the station, I see police officers with the same three or three carbines, about three or four of them kneeling on one knee on the road with their rifles pointed south of Abercrombie. They have been sent to protect the government station because, you know, the normal pattern is people in revolutions and riots and so on attack the media and try to seize the station. And I remember Dennis Pantin, he was a duty. And he came downstairs and he was saying, guys, look at this thing, any minute now we'll get hit. So let's go inside. So we did that and they never did come to us. But I think they swept up Frederick Street and started to shatter stores, windows and glass things. Get back into the station and come to terms with this new dispensation, this new dimension. After that, I placed the call to the army to try and verify this thing and got on to Rexless Alphas. The operator, I believe, on duty then and then for many days after was an officer named Robinson. He patched me through to Rexless Al. Rex was then and subsequently continued to be a very reticent, very almost shy, apparently a highly competent Sanders trained officer, but not the talker. And he actually said that to me when I had him on the phone, asking him to allow me to interview him. And he said, look, Ralph is the talker, but the two of us have taken some action here and let Ralph explain it to you. And that's how I met Ralph Fischer on the phone. And I did the interview with Ralph Fischer. And I tell you, to me, one of the most significant things that popped up in that interview was when I asked him a straightforward question, anybody would ask him, why are you taking this action? You called upon to mobilize to help the state, and you instead, they had imprisoned their senior officers, taken control, and then mounted up. And you know what he said? Alfred, this was not a mutiny. This was definitely not a mutiny. And he's talking to me while still holding Tetron. So he had no reason, unless he was gifted with extreme foresight and extremely perspicacious, he was saying, I figured truthfully, and I still think so, this was not a mutiny. This was a workers' strike. And I said, come again? He said, we are workers. We have been complaining to the government for years now. We went off to San Luis Rex and I, we came back. It sharpened our complaints because we now knew all that was wrong about the army. The army was being very badly run by these jokers. He said, we wrote letters to the Minister of National Security. I do a quick jump forward so you understand. Years later, I met the guy who had been the permanent secretary in the Ministry of National Security. I think it used to be called Home Affairs. And he told me, when I was permanent secretary, Rex and Rafik used to write these letters all the time to the minister. He said, and I used to just throw him an address, I never sent them to the minister. And I said, you did what? He said, no, the minister didn't know all these complaints and all these stupid little boys, man. Because he was a grown man and so on. And they had this language of behaviors in old colonial times. So this is Ralph now saying, we have complained, we have written letters there. And Ralph and Rex could write and they could speak. And we felt that as workers, we were not heeded. Now you were calling on us to go to work with down tools. It is not a mutiny, he said. It's a strike. He said, and we were going uptown to see if we can bring any order, but not to join in any revolution. So anyway, it was a nice work, sort of very good, certainly a very good explanation, if not a defense. And that's established link. So I would interview him several times a day. But better yet, the guy who was a telephone operator would call me several times to give me updates on how things were there. Most of all, to see things were getting very bad down there. They needed medical supplies, they needed replacement food, they needed some people needed to be attended to. The Coast Guard particularly needed serious psychological therapy. 
and I saw it for myself. So I get this word from Rafi that they're going to have a requiem mass down at Tetra for private day. And I said to the guys, Rafi, can I come in and attend that? And Rafi said, sure, why not? By that time, because of the failure of Carl and Phillips negotiations, Eric appointed retired Brigadier General Jeff Sorrett, who had been a beloved leader of Trinidad Defense Force for years. And he came out of the colonial time from the West Indian Regiment and Sarah took on the job. So, hearing about this requiem month, I got in touch with Geoff Sarah and I said, Brigadier, I understand you have the mass, I would like to go in and cover it. So he said, oh, yeah, the mass is going to be celebrated by Archbishop Tony Pankin and his assistant in celebrating the mass was a Catholic priest who was then chaplain to the army, Father Kevin Power, an Irish guy. He was in the Irish army and Father Power was my dean of discipline when I was a student at Fatima. So I knew him then. I think he gave me some cutting once or twice. And I'm saying to Brigadier Sarah, can I follow them in to cover this? He said, um, let me get permission from the PM and I'll let you know. He said, call me back at this number. So I called him back as appointed. And who answers the phone? A fellow named Eric Williams. He's at the Prime Minister's residence discussing matters. And I asked for him. Uh, Eric Williams didn't tell me who he was. I just asked if I could speak to Brigadier Sarah to put him on. And I said, do we have a go? And he said, yes come to the gate at Tetra, let them know to phone me and I'll give you clearance to come in. Who's coming? I say, well, two of us, my program director and myself, we are there. So we then hooked up with Archbishop Martin and we drove behind them when they were going in. When we got to Stobles Bay, we saw a number of Coast Guardsmen standing out on the grass verge in their uniform. A number of them were holding on to the chain link fence and just screaming at the top of their voices. They were having meltdowns. We took note of that. It was a Sunday, mass going to be said. We have a noon cast coming up, so I'm saying, well, we must file a report on this. I mean, the nation is waiting on this. I radio back to the station and say, look, we want to do this report. So I said, I will file a report on what I'm seeing here, and then I'll file later on on how the mass went and who I interviewed and so on. By the time we got to the main entrance of Tetron Base now, Sarah is there waiting. He said, that's what I told you, not to, not to break radio silence now. So I said, oh my God, I didn't tell me that, but I'm sure enough thing. So I said, I apologize about that. It was just to do a, a really harmless report. And, All right, okay, let's go. And he said, follow me. And we walked across the courtyard, which was the parade ground, from the gate towards where the mass was going to be celebrated. And I saw no signs of threat. No weapons were displayed. Outside the church, first of all, before the mass started, I met both Rex and Rafi for the first time in person. And remember Rex going into the, the congregation and Rafi not. And I said, Ralph, okay, are you going in? So he said, no, 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 I'm an atheist. And I said, okay, no problem. So those are snatches I remember. The mass was celebrated. After the mass, they said, let's go to the officer's mess, you guys, let's have something to eat. And when we got there, Sarah turned to me and he said, I hope you see for yourselves, gentlemen. Tetra is like a playground. Tetra is like a playground. I said, wow, that was my quote. So that became the news piece I was able to run out of. And we completed a meal and then we left. So. I had a different sense of what was happening there. I remained in touch with them on the phone. From time to time, the guy Robinson would call and say, we're breaking out, you know. We ain't care, damn, you know, we're coming out tonight, you know. And that rumor would get to the police very quickly because families were suffering. I remember him saying that a number of officers lived in an area in the Shagramas zone, an area called Granwood. And this guy was saying, look, talk to the government, do something because Soldiers' wives not getting the men's salary. We can't come out. People are hungry down here. We need medication. In fact, when we were leaving, I asked if there's anything we could do when we were back up town. And Rafik said, just ask Julia to send some medication, like tranquilizers and so on, and a lot of food. So I relayed that to Julia. So, 
Tony May, as police commissioner, presiding over this uprising, would hold press conference because a lot of foreign press had come every day, and I would go to them. The press conferences would have been happening in a period of uncertainty. Nobody knew what was going to happen. And one day, I went to the press conference, and it came to an end. Tony May said, thank you, gentlemen, and so on. And the TV guys took off their lights, remember BBC guys being there, and they all left. I was going to leave, and Commissioner May said, okay, don't hold on a minute, you wait. And he let everybody leave. And he started to chat with me, and we'll talk and ask something. And I eventually said, look, these guys have been arrested. What's going to happen with them? He said, Aki, tell you, ever heard of something called the plea of condonation? So I said, not at all. He said, well, that is a military principle and rule by which the military runs its affairs. I said, okay, I could try and find out, look it up. But he wasn't telling me more. He said, you look it up and you will see what will happen. Those guys are going to get off and they will get off on the basis of the plea of condemnation. So I said, wow. And then months went by until eventually when the guys did the appeal and they went before the appeal court headed by Aubrey Fraser and tell us for judges and so on. They got off on the grounds of, if not entirely, but the plea of condemnation was cited. And as afterwards I heard explained, he said, what I had indicated to them was, surrender yourself and I would then take the responsibility for having, as it were, forgiven you, to condone what you did. And as a senior officer, if I do that, you cannot be convicted and all of that. So, they got off. So that was Alfred Agueton giving his account of his coverage, really, and experiences of the um, from the morning of the state of emergency on the 21st of April. And I should also mention at this juncture that um, if you heard his contribution last Sunday, where he spoke about the march through Karani and, and what took place in front of the house of Bade Sagan Maraj, he described that the whole crowd fell silent and and then Badis raised his fist and said, Power to the people. Well, we informed by Clive Nunez that it was him, in fact, who gave the instruction to the crowd to be silent, to raise their fists and to, to make a, an eyes right, to basically turn away from Mirage. Um, but uh, Alfred would not have known that that instruction was given but his his description of it is still one that um is was very moving and and um and memorable yeah yeah so and also uh one thing that stood out to me in his contribution real quick Mm -hmm. when rex told him this is not a mutiny it's a workers strike yes interesting and interesting interesting twist to that and um I'm just hoping, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we've learned a lot from this series. I'm just hoping as well that the hierarchy of the Trinidad Tobago Defense Force, Mm -hmm. whoever would have tuned in, whichever Sunday, what they heard here as well, they would pick out the things that make sense that can apply to today Mm -hmm. and, of course, put it on the front, you know, put it up on the blackboard at least. All right. Some of those concerns remain up to today, eh? Yes. Unfortunately. um, So, but, um, that was Alfred Arito giving his take and uh, we thank him for the time. We have a quite an international audience with us and we thank you guys too. Bev from Brooklyn, Marlon from Toronto, Anthony from Grenada, Jeffrey well, from Tobago, Clive <laughs> Nunez, Black Shea from Georgia. That's the daughter, one of Clive's daughter. Uh, Khalil Boyce, Chris here from Aruka, Jenny Singh, Curtis Duki Batch, we didn't batch, I'm um, Kay- can't pronounce it, but it's Kyra, Kyra from Barbados, Gary Connell from the U.S. Alison and all the rest of you folks, thank you very much for joining us. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, the one of the anticipated responses from Lou Jones, retired Staff Sergeant Lou Jones. He, Lou Jones, would have been the person in Tetron that morning 
walking around and seeing what was taking place and he gave his account also including in that account was the family um of luke uh, colonel luke so we'll hear what he have to say when we return remember you can join us live on facebook our independency on facebook to see what's going on because we have some pictures and of course some of our ads are on live as well so you're going to take a break we'll be right back This is Reality Radio at its best. I on dependency on I-95.5. Ah, boy. I feel like I'm going to buy myself a senorita tonight. Nah, nah, nah. You know you might be promoting slavery. Slavery? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? Hey. Modern day slavery or human trafficking is just what some of these people just do. You know some of these women were tricked to come here? Some are held against their will, abused, and even beaten. Most times the girls don't even see any of the money that is paid for them. And every night, they just have to come out looking nice and sexy for somebody like you. Human trafficking is a serious problem and a serious crime. Persons who solicit commercial sex services may be contributing to human trafficking. A message from the Counter Trafficking Unit of the Ministry of National Security. Hello? Hi, this is Patricia Kent from HMP London. Can I speak to Miss Sheila, please? This is Miss Sheila. Hi, I've got an important call for you. Please hold the line. Mommy, it's Sherry. Oh, God, Sherry, we're looking for you all the time. Three weeks now. Where are you going? Mommy, I called him to tell you I get lock up. I had drugs in my luggage and I'm in England right now. In jail. Oh, God, Sherry, what? What are you doing? Are you in jail? Oh, God, are we going to Oh, God, Mommy, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. It'll be all right. Sorry. I'm sorry. I on Dependency, reality radio at its best, every Sunday from 6.15 to 8 p.m. on I 95.5 FM. Don't My name it. is Lou Golding, and I'm the manager of the Substance Abuse Program for African, Canadian, and Caribbean Youth at CAMH in Toronto, Canada. And you're listening to I on Dependency with Garth and Natasha, Trinidad and Tobago. You're listening to I on Dependency with Garth and Natasha. Reality Radio at its best. All right, thank you for staying with us. And let's go right now to... Lou Jones, as he gave his response to the contributions from the Luke family. Here's Lou Jones. Mr. Kenneth Luke, what are your thoughts on what he said? I want to make it abundantly clear to him from what he said. It leaves the impression like if I was part of the mutineers, I was never involved in the mutiny. I never took part in the mutiny. I was totally against the mutiny. I was getting out of Tetron because I was feeling unsafe remaining in Tetron after all that I spoke about had happened. I heard him saying I was jumping off the truck and jumping off the truck and I came off the truck once when we convoy stopped on the hill just after his house. When I came out of the truck, I went down to Tetron, George Simon, an athlete, and my batch, Perryman. They said, Lou, what you doing? I said, I going down the road. I'm not safe here. Any kind of decisions they're making here, we're spending too much time. That was after Bailey had got killed. I decided to walk back up the hill, past Luke House, three of us, and we walked down to Tetron. It take about two hours before the people from the convoy, some of them came walking down, some came driving. They heard them coming back. Now, I want to let them understand too clearly the house that they live in. After they abandoned the house, 
Nobody didn't go and loot the house during the time that we were on the hill. That house was looted sometime overnight. Now, I wanted to make clear, I 99% believe if it had the family in the house, those soldiers would not have gone there. He spoke about the father radiogram when we was listening to music. I don't know how the radiogram got there and who bring it down there. But what I mentioned in my interview, I said clearly, we got up in the morning and I heard Otis Redding playing. I said, where are music coming from? Up in the corner in Bravo Company Barroom downstairs, they had a radiogram there. I asked around where they get the radiogram from. And I heard somebody say, they get it by Luke House. Now I want them to understand too, what I said about his father is facts. His father was a very good officer administratively. He was the quartermaster when I joined the army. He used to be always neatly dressed. He had his driver, he pulled it. He had men working with him, Matura, Indianish looking one, with glasses, a old guy. All those were people working with him. And he was very good, like Colonel Faustin during his time, were very good administratively. The problem I see come out during my experience with him, he was away for a little while. He had problem when he came back from the course with Shah and LaSalle. They had problem down in the mess. It had nothing to do with the back room. Now, after 1970, I don't believe that he should have forward the experience in the house, bringing them back before making the house ready for the family to come back. They would not have been traumatized by what they saw. He, as an officer, should have known better make a decision to get their clean up. They had the authority to get their clean up, the grass cut, everything had cooled down months after. Now, I don't know anybody hating him during that time or prior to that from the company, Bravo company that I was part of. LaSalle was my platoon commander and Shaw was the platoon commander of another platoon in Bravo company. Now, he talked about discipline and how his father was a very strict disciplinarian and probably people like me have him off for disciplining us. We did have no dealings with him prior to 1970 in Bravo Company. The company commander prior to 1970 was a very strict disciplinary and the last of the white men, they called Hilton Edwards. We go on exercise in the fields, he would be right there, always. He was a real soldier, and I believe he was on his train. He was one of the men that had a grudge with the administration and he resigned because of his seniority and they didn't promote him. Now, I had experience with Luke running Bravo Company after the mutiny. They brought him to be OC Bravo Company. That is where I had dealing with him and all the other men had dealing with him. Whatever he had any mess with the other officers and prior to that, I did not know. All I know, he wasn't popular with them. But then my experience with him is what I could talk about. As a company commander, commanding men in a company is different to running an administrative office like the quartermaster stores. You deal with a hundred and something men. Some of them married, some have wives, some have children. Forget the family part. Just remember that these men are soldiers but human beings too. He come as OC at that company with Ram Narayan as the company sergeant major. I had to deal with him. I don't know if he was aware of but Bravo Company was the company that lead the mutiny. When Colonel Luke came in the company as company commander, that is where he lost popularity among the troops. And that is what I was talking about, not about the mutiny. He as a company commander had people wondering at times with the decisions he used to make for the company. I say, boy, if we had to go outside on the fields and we had to come under fire, he have to depend on the same men in the company, the rifle company, and he have to depend on them same men to give him cover in fire if he had to move from one point to another. He had to remember that. He didn't run the company as a company. Let me give you an example of how the son not believing what I say. We were part of a soldier's guard of honor that was getting married, as the army normally do, apply for permission to marry months before. He knew the men that he wanted in his guard of honor. I was one of the men in Bravo Company who was supposed to be in that guard of honor. Now this is something this guy preparing, but during the course of the week, he got checked for his haircut. He had orders the Friday. His wedding is Sunday, and he got from Colonel Luke three days confinement to Barrack, which we does for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. He asked for an interview, knowing about the marriage, because everybody knows he's getting married, he gets three days CV. He called Ram Narayan and he tell Ram Narayan that he wants to have an interview with the OC. We want to remind him that his wedding is Sunday. So we're there waiting. Next thing, the colonel walk out of the office, orders finish. No interviews. 
And Ramarang came out same time and told the soldier you UC here having no interviews. And he tried to talk to the UC. Nobody didn't tell me. I heard the colonel say he know he getting married son, he should not have committed himself. We asked the soldier what to do then because when he were in he says CV or no CV, I going home. He ran away. He got married and he came back in the Tuesday. He was arrested when he came in. And the same colonel Luke gave him 14 days confinement to barracks. And he just married. Is that discipline? I'm telling you the truth. What I'm telling you is all truth. It may not be all of the truth, but it's all truth. This son that took Sunday, he must understand that his father was a very good father to him as everybody expects. And I believe so. He would love his father as a father and admire him whenever he dressed and jumped in a jeep to go to work. But when you come to work with men, he did not have the experience most of them experience. I am not the only one in the army who know that his father was very unpopular in the army during his last days. So I just talk from my experience with him. I saw his son work in places where there were people manage him. I saw he maybe he met managers who wasn't popular in the company he worked with. Now that manager may have a family with children who like him very much. My daddy is the best daddy. But in the office, people may not like him. And he have to understand, being a company commander over 100 men is different from when you're home dealing with your children. See? Luke was my father and I love him the same way too. I didn't cause his unpopularity. And I want to tell him he need to look for closure. So i sorry for him. I have nothing to apologize to him for. I spoke the truth about his father. All right, so there you have it. Respond some Lou Jones, and um, I hope I really, I mean, we really didn't plan for this angle to take. However, um, again, Lou felt that he needed to respond to some of the things. And I, some of the things that he said, I when Kenneth and I am sp speaking to off, you know, off the air, this is what I would discuss with him too about, you know, um, his family and and I believe and I believe what Lou said if the family was in the house so let's would not have gone in there but you know they would they weren't there the night sometimes they're doing guard any night man get hungry they see a house they go inside the house and they one thing is well, always have rebel soldiers among the rebels too who would have there are those who have respect and those who won't and um that they have to understand too the camaraderie with soldiers you see that wedding that would have hurt even the 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 the, the, the cookhouse staff to know that hey this man getting married and this had to happen they you know soldiers will hire off for that as a commander so i understand that and as i said he would have been a good father but there are a number of things that they wouldn't would have would have not been exposed to with him in the force and that is another story i We'll speak to this later on in the program because I want to go into detail. As I said to the people who make phone calls and you all had a problem with us giving Kenneth Luke and his family the time to speak, the same people who felt we cut him off too soon when he called the first time. There's a thing called now PTSD. Back in the days, in the 60s and the 70s, substance abuse, domestic violence, all of these things weren't scientific. Drug use, nothing was scientific it was just pure brute force and you apply you know as someone said if all you have in your, in your toolbox is a hammer everything will look as a nail and fast forward to today this 50 years later a lot of things have gone scientific and kenneth luke especially is still so angry that he don't even know how angry he is about so many things but you see for me to go through my recovery i had to attend so many sessions it's like a hundred and more just yesterday i was checking i had to go to a hundred and more sessions in rehab in workshops you name it so i could get over my trauma of being discharged from the military there are some people who went to the military and just passed through like a breeze and there are those who were soldiers i've always said it there are people who joined the army and they are soldiers just like there are people who join the Coast Guard and they are sailors. Two different kettle of fish. So for me, 
for me i had to go through my trauma when i was discharged from the and Tobago regiment when i sobered up that is when my trauma started but none of you who made phone calls didn't care about maxwell about Bert neptune japa remember fredericks one of the best midfielders in the country at the time remember right a coffee from the base and so many others who made our exit from the military for drug use you all understand the trauma we went through well i had to reach in a place of forgiveness that forgiveness did not come easy especially when i found out that the military should have done better by us but i couldn't have them off because they didn't give me an order to use drugs and then turn their back on me when i went when i went bad i made the decision to try the drugs because it introduced to us in there we got sick they sent us home and little do you all know that most of the people we interviewed here are people who was responsible for my discharge i don't know if colonel salandi remembers he was the last officer that i interacted with when i was discharged he took my documents up to major general ralph brown you heard them on this program and i could hate these men no they were just doing their job back in tetron the first arrest started with byron paul all you know him as bp bp like my grandfather today i could hate bp for arresting me but that's where my 42 days detention started you know where the 42 who i got it from retired colonel daniel barry thomas was his adjutant and i remember when i went for, before colonel daniel to get for, for the orders he asked me would i accept punishment or court martial i say i would accept punishment because i was a good pity and i didn't think it hit me so hard he gave me 42 days detention and then he fainted in the office 42 days because you all know what 42 days meant right and i went through that i escaped custody just to go look for drugs because why because they didn't understand drug use back then i saw colonel daniel when i went back before him now for the discharge he told me frankly you don't deserve to be a soldier fall out and i left tetron barracks went to the base colonel salandi did the rest major general ralph brown put the stamp on the discharge and i was gone i could hate these men today no i couldn't they were just doing the job but i had to find myself in a place of forgiveness for that to happen this is where kenneth luke and his family is not there yet and one session with a psychologist is not even going to get them there they have to do several sessions go into their heads and see what else have them so angry because there are two things with the father that i felt the father sh- sh- fell short on them one was leaving them in tetron barracks between tetron and coast guard that morning from the time the first shot was fired he would have known he should have called coast guard and said get my family out of there immediately moving williams went for his family and left kenneth to fend for his entire family as the eldest one escaping gunshot and all kind of thing that wrongs went through the car will you forget that so kenneth still has to be angry and and the other area he fell short is carrying them back to the house in the state that it was in he should not have done that he should have gone wreck the house first get a fatigue done on it clean it up nice it up they would have never know something happened there but he took them back to the trauma double trauma here oak charlotte described opening the fridge and seeing imagine people are fridge you seen a big ham it was a big family so that was no small ham i'm sure and a big ham turned into worms a four-year-old child seen that she will still be traumatized to this day so understand why we give him the time we give them the time to speak i had to get time to speak to find myself in a place so that i could forgive now i offer myself to the defense force so that i could prevent other sailors and soldiers from walking the road i've walked and made the wrong choices i did so that they could get a dishonorable discharge we will go through that in the pictures that we have to show you so understand let me give you a little story about blake only remember blake blake was working at the time blake was on my back like a wet shirt all the time if i open my locker blake inside if i go in the ablution blake inside it before me when i come out he right there when i close my locker door blake stand up right on it blake made a vow to me that if it's one thing he will make sure i got discharged blake and blake was on me fingerprinted me and all our weapon went missing maxwell and i got fingerprinted because they thought it was us who stole it 
Fast forward to when I went to CCC. And as I say, God bless Anthony Philip Spencer, Brigadier General, for opening the door here and Keith Hines. When everybody else was hiding my documents, they decided I have something to offer Trinidad and Tobago and they called me to CCC. And while I was at CCC, my phone rang. I was a senior supervisor, populations department. Blake on the other end. Blake say, God Sinclair, this Blake here. What happened, Blake? What going on? Boy, I need job. I need a job, boy. Pressure, pressure. Now, this is the man who ensured that I got this charge. Eh? You know what I did? I said, brother, I go try my best to help you. I hung the phone up and I called Rupert Celestin. Thank God he's still alive to bear me out on this. Rupert Celestin, I said, Blake just called me. He's looking for a job at CCC. He's a former soldier. He's, enti- he's not entitled, but, you know, he, he, he could be given a chance. I didn't tell you what Celestin did after that, but I could have hung up the phone and laughed at Blake. Why could I have done that for Blake? I forgive him because he was just doing his job. I tried to tell Kenneth Luke and his family that the revolution, the, mut- the mutiny had nothing to do with them. Shirafik Shah and the boys did not go after the Luke family. It was a bigger picture. They were just caught in the middle of Tetron and Coast Guard. That's the only fault of theirs. And their father, I think, should have done better by them in those two instances, as I mentioned. And I told Mr. Kenneth, so it's not something I'm saying behind their back. So understand, people, that this is all part of healing for them. What I'm doing here is healing too as well, because I do even have to be talking nothing but the military. I can still have off the military to this day. Brigadier Peter Joseph visited me in the cell the, the December 88, just before I got discharged. He and Commodore oh, deceased yeah. Moving Williams. That was the last visit from them. They sent everybody home and leave me in the cell alone. I was discharged February 89, January 89, by Colonel Daniel. Everywhere I see Colonel Daniel, I know I give him a hug and show you're doing so. He and all was surprised the first time I show. Barry Thomas and I still good. And they were the two people, adjutant and CEO, who discharged me. So come on. I trying to get Luke in that situation. Forgiveness is very important for moving on understand that people and i'm very proud of where i am today very very proud and i hope that kenneth and they will find themselves in that position one day but to lighten that load and clean the subconscious with the things there you had you had to forgive put it aside and forgive as i said now i am sorry that i'm not permanently a part of the the the, the recruiting structure of the force that i could help them now recognize potential drug users because the recruiter batch of 100 bet your life 25 of those will go left for various reasons why because it has gone scientific chew on that after this break we'll be back with david brizan thank you for listening folks thank you natasha we take a break we'll be right back Eye on Dependency, where every life is a biography on the eye. Slavery, a terrible time in our history. The kidnapping, buying and selling of people for profit, the exploitation of another human being. It still exists today. It has a new name, human trafficking. Anyone can be a victim. There is forced labor, sexual exploitation and domestic servitude. Human trafficking is a worldwide problem and an emerging concern for us here in Trinidad and Tobago. If you know of or suspect human trafficking activity, call the counter-trafficking hotline at 800-4CTU or 800-4288. Human trafficking is a crime. Identify it, report it, stop it. A message from the counter-trafficking unit of the Ministry of National Security. Mr. Dobson here from HMP London. Uh, can I speak to Mr. James, please? This is Mr. James speaking. Thank you. Can you hold the line? I have a call coming through soon, sir. Sure. Hello, Daddy. Hello, yes, Brian? Daddy. I'm just calling to tell you that I'm um, locked up in the, in, in the UK 
for, for drug trafficking. Oh yeah? You lock up? And you tell me I was going to Bego? And I tell you about them boy I was liming with? Well alright. Don't drop the soap. Cheerio. I on Dependency. Reality Radio at its best. Every Sunday from 6.15 to 8 p.m. on Thank you for staying with us and we are quickly going to go on to the gentleman who no one has heard from until today. This is the first time we're going to be hearing his voice. He, his name is David Brizan. He was one of the officers that had been sent on training courses um, along with Rafik and Rex and some and others. Um, and at the time of the when the mutiny occurred, he was in fact in Canada on a course and he was returned to Trinidad to face trial for a letter that he, that he had written to Rex LaSalle, sort of in support of what they had been discussing all along and remonstrating the, the brass of the top brass of the military um, and he was put on trial for that he was convicted he spent time in prison was released and went on to as Garth was just talking about forgive and forget he moved on with his life and he's become a very successful man and business person <coughs> in his own right so we are very pleased to have been able to speak with him and <coughs> and allowed uh, and him allowing us to record what he had to say so without further ado david Bizan. when i went to the santos in uh July of 1965. I actually entered in September and it was the toughest time of my life in terms of the training and I was unsure whether I could endure. But it was at that time that Rafi came over to my room and shared with me what he was doing and he agreed to work with me and we used to run up a hill. I can't describe or tell you what the name of the hill is because that would be rude and it would be very obscene for that kind of description to hear. But Rafik literally held my hand and he took me on the course and we were preparing for something called the obstacle course, which is a, a sort of 10 mile jaunt with full kit and so on and so on. It's a very tough course. And Rafik worked with me in, in uh, preparing me for that. And as I said before, I didn't know Rafik was an Indian. I had no idea he was Indian. He was just a, someone who I, I thought of in those days as a brother. And he just took me through that course to the point where I became so confident that I went on to succeed within the two-year period to win the best stick, which is the stick that represents the highest form of achievement. So I, I was the top of the class of all of the cadets from abroad. And that was a source of great pride. And I made the attribution to Rafik because if it wasn't for him, you know, I don't think I would have made it. But there were others who were there as well who passed through, but were too um, so ostentatious in their display. They wanted to pound the chest and show that they had come through the toughness of the place and so on to show how good they were. And uh, they tended to put you down a little bit. And so I wasn't at all pleased by them. And they were the ones who came back in the late 60s and did not make the kind of contribution that would have been defined by the humble approach that Rafik took. Rafik was a, a very humble soldier. 
he didn't punch chest, he didn't boast, but he was one little tough guy. And he was very sensitive and very much in love with his people and his group. So I was very grateful to Rafi for the success that I had. And so we became friends. Like I said, I didn't know he was Indian. It's only when um, Pandi made a reference to the Indian Makaram that I say, oh, wait a minute, I didn't know that. But he was just a comrade to me. And he stayed that way. And I love the guy. He, I mean, he, he got into writing. I didn't think he was a good writing sort of person at, at first. But clearly he settled down nicely into the program and did well to the point where he, he's a, a very popular writer now. So yeah, so he was central. Reginald and I, that is Rex, and I became friends mainly after the process. Rex had gone to England to study the health field and he met me in New York in 1972 and was also instrumental in guiding me in participating in a program we call it the S program, that's ESC, the Earhart Seminar Training, which is a program where you go through a two-week isolation where you look at who you are in the world and who you deserve to be and the, the role that that commitment plays in your life and, and so on. Now, I didn't have the funds to do that program. And Rick said, boy, this program is so good. I will pay for you to do it which was a remarkable thing and I, that is a program that turned my life around. So both Rafik and Rex made a contribution to, to my civilian life, to the attitude that I have, you know, and so I'm grateful to both of them. But they are really the only two officers that impressed me and the only two that I've come to stay close to. At the time of the event, of course, I wasn't here. I had gone to the Canadian Forces Base in Ontario to do a weapons course. I don't know why the hell we needed to send people to do that kind of anti-tank course, but we had a tank here, we had nothing so. But anyway, I was glad to go and do the course, which I did, but it was during that time that that event took place. And I wrote to Rex, letting him know that I was uh, in support um, what I thought had taken place. Of course, the events as described and what I thought were not the same, because we used to meet once or twice a week or whatever to look at what is the likely response that we could have to the civil unrest. Because left to the commanding people at that time, we would just go there and shoot people now. And I wasn't about to shoot my sister pilot who was marching up and down the damn street. So there was an issue that I faced as to what I would do in terms of whether they sent us out to put down any kind of um, unrest. We hadn't completed that discussion when the events took place. And the understanding that I had is that they attempted to arrest a few of the guys, maybe on the raft and so on. But I don't know what happened, what actually took place on that day. What I do know is that a lot of the young guys, we used to meet and discuss what the hell is going to happen. Because we were disinclined to use the force to put up a civilian uh, uh, unrest. Particularly ones in which you're, you're very far was involved. I wasn't going out there to shoot nobody. I, didn't feel that that was what I, I was trained for. So the letter that I wrote to Rex described the army brass as stupid because they were frankly. I thought so then and I still think so. They were in that for themselves. You had people down here at the top level who were interested in their own personal improvement, meaning that they looked after themselves. But the soldiers um, weren't treated well, they weren't paid well then. And there was a general state of unrest among the soldiers. And nothing was being done at a social level to really address that. And there was a slight gap between those who led and those who were being led. And that gap was never philosophically resolved. I mean, it's just the command, you do what you're told to do. I did not agree with that. So I really didn't think of myself, even though I was a sad history and I didn't think of myself as that kind of soldier that I did just as people what to do. Remember that I came out of Trumaca, Lavantel, and a lot of the soldiers there came from that area. And there was a bond I had with them, not because of the army, but because of the economic circumstance out of which we came. I was not about to break that bond. I, I was very close to my soldiers. I didn't see them as subordinates. I saw them as people with whom I grew up, and I just had the advantage of having been trained and wearing two bits on my shoulders to indicate my rank and all that. But I didn't feel rankish, feel like a big boy to them. You know, I never had that sense. They were always part of my family. 
had that kind of bond with them. And I don't know if it had to do with the kind of thing and trying to hide it out that. I think it's just the fact that we grew up together and we can speak here together and we had something here that could help us. So it was more a, a kind of economic reprieve for me, the whole question of the silence training and so forth, than the achievement of some worthy goal. I can say that comfortably now because of the distance between now and those events and it's very clear to me that I didn't feel like any part of the military brass that didn't feel that way at all. All right, so there you have it. That was David Brizan giving his take and his account of the letter to Rex LaSalle. Mm-hmm. Very interesting, you know, um, what he said about Rex. And I remember asking him this when we were talking, if he felt, you know, that the the military is what gave him that kind of bond and camaraderie with, with those other guys. And he said, no, I, it, it was just a human connection that they made and they turned out to be lifelong friends so i guess it's him being in that in that situation in that position and and it's very remarkable to how he dealt with and moved on from what happened to him being sent to prison for writing a letter essentially he mm-hmm. could have left that situation with a lot of hurt and anger towards the military but he he just left Trinidad and never looked back. Yeah, and he rebuilt his life. And you know, his Now he's life, a very yes. successful man and yes. doing well. So, you know, good evening to Judy and Captain Derek Lamb. He said, good evening, guys, and Natasha. I can attest to what is PTSD. As up to this day, I cannot find it within me to visit Camp Omega. Hmm. I still have visions of my batch 4197 Ali N lying like a burnt manicou after the explosion. Wow. You know, and um, again, you know, good... Ooh, wow. wow! Here we have online. Good Anthony, evening, sir. Brigadier General Anthony <laughs> W.J. Phyllis Spencer. Good evening, Mr. Gart and Mr. Sinclair, and to everyone else tuned in. As I am to this insightful discussion, have a blessed evening and week. And same to you, sir. Our ambassador over there in Washington D.C., Anthony W.J. Phyllis Spencer, Brigadier General, as you would know him. David Bizan, first time giving an account of this letter and we thank him very much for giving us the opportunity to air that yes. so most of you who weren't even in the work you know then, uh, um, i mean who were in the work then and didn't know about that letter you heard it from you know the horse's mouth so to yes. speak yes. good evening anna or the end is atlanta she's i think at aparicio good evening to you and all of you who just joining us um remember we will be showing you pictures of those who contributed to this series and the supporting cast as well and um you know i i, I would just remember to tell kenneth again please I, I know it's difficult i know it's hard it you all those words to even think about you know forgiving but i think is the best way to move on and as I went so far, we invited Major General Rathbong to a function at CCC. Remember that, Natasha? Yes, yes. And I stood there. Yeah. yeah, and I stood there and I apologized to him for what I did to the colors, embarrassing the colors. Imagine I turning around and apologizing for getting discharged because of using drugs. And he made the Major General cry, you know. <laughs> Tears came to his eyes. Yeah, he cried because he too regretted having to discharge us. But that was it back then. And I had to understand that and come to terms with that. Now drug use and everything is scientific and we have to approach it a different way. And I could go so far as to tell you I was even part of a policy discussion that they're framing for the force. I don't know where it is now, so I can't speak to it. But I was even invited to help them put that together. And I'm really happy for that. So my, my, my experience could help others. We're grateful for that. So thank you once again, Alfred Aguito, who's still very much alive. <laughs> yes. Lou Jones, Staff Sergeant Lou Jones, and David Brizan. Thank you very much for installing your input into the final chapter of this first season of the events of 1970. We're going to take a break and we're going to hook up Mr. Rafik Shah for him too to have a little say before we go through the parade of the pictures. So stay right there. We'll be back. 
This is Reality Radio at its best. I am. It's actually not my real name. You don't really care, do you? All you care about is want to pay your money to my boss that I look pretty, smell nice, smile for you, and let you have good time. Enjoying yourself and doing to me whatever you want to do for the money you pay. What you don't see or know is that I don't get any part of the money you paid. My boss takes all of it. I am forced to work, taking as many clients as my boss tells me to. I am beaten, made to take drugs, and I cannot leave this kind of work on my own. I am a victim of human trafficking. Please, por favor, help me. Hello. Hi, this is Patricia Kent from HMP London. Can I speak to Miss Sheila, please? This is Miss Sheila. Hi, I've got an important call for you. Please hold the line. Mommy, it's Shari. Oh, God, Shari, we're looking for you all the time. Three weeks now. Where are you going? Mommy, I'm calling to tell you I get locked up. I had drugs in my luggage and I'm in England right now. In jail. Oh, God, Shari, what? What are you doing? How are you reading there? Oh, God, how are we going to do? Oh, God, Mommy, don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. It'll be all right. Sorry. I'm sorry. I on Dependency, reality radio at its best, every Sunday from 6.15 to 8 p.m. on I-95.5 FM. Don't miss it. My name is Joanne Ferdinand. I am a Justice of the Supreme Court in New York State, and you are listening to I on Dependency with Garth and Natasha on I-95.5 FM, Trinidad and Tobago. You're listening to I on Dependency with Garth and Natasha, reality radio at its best. All right, thank you for seeing with us and online. Let's get to him right away, Mr. Rafiq Shah. Good evening, Mr. Shah. Good evening, guys. Good evening, sir. How are you doing? Good, good evening, Natasha. Not too bad. All right. So, what was your take on on what we attempted to do here in terms of reliving the events of, of the mutiny of 1970? Well, when I reflect on it, I mean, um, when you all started, I, I like you, I suppose I expected it to be maybe a two-part series, but it turned out to be much longer than that. Um, I am happy it went that way, the way it did, by you sourcing and, and people helping you to source others who were involved in 1970 in that mutiny. You see, the, the events associated directly with the Black Power Movement. So those events were in the public domain from day one. Yes. Uh, they happened in Port of Spain, the media, the public was there, the marches, um, you know, we saw them swell from a couple hundred people to thousands of people to tens of thousands of people. Um, and the media was there all along. And so it was public. Um, everything was in the public domain. In the case of what happened at Tetron with the mutiny, that was secluded. No members of the media were, would have been covering the mutiny as an event. Mm. Alfred Agito, I was happy that you all got someone like Alfred because he was the only one that he was one of two journalists who came down to Tetron during the mutiny. Now, there were 
journalists from abroad and so on who had hired boats to try to come into Tetra and to, to cover the scene to see what was happening. But Alfred, we invited him down and um, arranged with Colonel Serret, as he then was, to uh, ensure that Alfred and Leo de Leon came down to Tetra and did coverage. But um, the point I, uh, that uh, what occurred to me most of all is that for the last 50 years, I have been the person carrying the burden of the to speaking about the mutiny. Yes. Um, and understandably so, because after in the aftermath of the mutiny, Mike Bazzi, Rex LaSalle, David Brisson left and went abroad to further their studies, and I remained in Trinidad. So I was the only one available to the media, to foreign journalists, to anybody who was doing anything about the, the mutiny. I was the one available. So I ended up talking about it at all kinds of forums, at conferences, on anniversaries, and so on. So it was good to have others, especially as you got people like David Brazan, my brother. Um, you know, we see each other as brothers, Rex LaSalle, Mike Bazzi, David Brisson, the late Lennox Gordon, he died. And, um, you know, even Selwyn Derrick, Hugh Vidal, uh, that, that, those of us who attended Sanders together, okay. um, more or less with slight overlap in time. Um, so I was happy that you all were able to get people and there were people who said things that I um, don't agree were correct. I, I, I think that they were, they were wrong in, what, in um, some of the statements they made. For example, you heard Alfred Agiton talk about the state of the men at, that he saw at Stobel's Bay, the Coast Guard mm -hmm. station when he entered. They looked mentally drained. We were aware of that, um, you, but you know, they, they, uh, some of, of the, the officers came there and spoke otherwise, suggesting that they were on top of their game all through. And I mean, it's for them if they want to blow their trumpet that way. No problem. I have no problem with them. They let them be. But I have tried as far as is practical to stick to the truth. Um, about my recollection and my in, in interventions. Um, and I am happy that others got the opportunity that you all provided on your platform, on your program, and brought out so many different aspects of the mutiny that I could never have covered and, you know, wouldn't dream of covering all those bases. Uh, so I want to um, thank you all for doing it and hope that you put together something uh, at the end of the, the day and uh, it's available to enhance the history of the country. I myself owe Trinidad uh, 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 and a commitment to finish the book I'm writing I've been writing for a long time on that mutiny and all the events from my perspective and the rebel soldiers perspective um, and I you know hope that I get the wherewithal and the will to finish that last two or three chapters that I need to to get it published. Yes, please. Um, yes, please. And and rest assured, we will, we do intend to to create a documentary, an hour-long documentary, kind of pulling 
all of the major bits and pieces from the series. So look out for that before the end of this year. Right. Okay. Well, it was nice talking with you all and, um, you know, keep up the good work that you have done on other topics as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shah. My pleasure. Take care and we'll keep in touch. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks. So there you have it. That's Rafiq Shah as he brings, you know, help us to put the icing on the cake here on this series of visit of 1970 mutiny. Again, to the Luke family, you were the only civilian, um, you know, group of people that we managed to to get your testimony from because you were caught in the middle of the crossfire. And once again, take it for what it is. I am sure it's only because you all were caught between Tetron and Coast Guard and won't put in a safe place at the time that you experienced what you did. PTSD is real and I pray we pray that you all continue to get the help that you need so that you all could reach in the place that way i am today and even forgive because as i said i'm guaranteeing you that it was not about the luke family unfortunately you all were just there that morning when we return we start the parade of all the veterans the retired personnel who contributed to this series so you get a chance to see them what they look like in kit we got some in civilian clothes um, but the majority you would see what they look like when they were young soldiers or in the prime of their career. You listen to Independency right here on I-95.5 FM and live on our Facebook page, Independency. We'll be back. Slavery. A terrible time in our history. The kidnapping by... Slavery. A terrible time in our history. The kidnapping, buying and selling of people for profit, the exploitation of another human being. It still exists today. It has a new name, human trafficking. Anyone can be a victim. There is forced labor, sexual exploitation and domestic servitude. Human trafficking is a worldwide problem and an emerging concern for here in Trinidad and Tobago. If you know of or suspect human trafficking activity, call the Counter Trafficking Hotline at 800-4CTU or 800-4288. Human trafficking is a crime. Identify it, report it, stop it. Message from the Counter Trafficking Unit of the Ministry of National Security. from HMP London. Uh, can I speak to Mr. James? This is Mr. James speaking. Thank you. Can you hold the line? I have a call coming through soon, sir. Sure. Hello, Daddy. Hello, yes. Daddy. I'm just calling to tell you that I'm locked up in the, in, in the UK for, for drug trafficking. Oh, yeah? You're locked up? And you tell me I was going to Bego? And I tell you about them boy, it was like me. Well, all right. Go drop the soap. Cheerio. I on Pendency. Reality radio at its best. Every Sunday from 6.15 to 8 p.m. On I-95.5 FM. 5.5 FM, Trinidad and Tobago. I on Dependency. I on Dependency. Where every life is a biography. On the I. 95.5. The most influential name in radio. Thank you for staying with us. This is Ion Dependency, and this is part 11 of our 1970 military mutiny series. We are wrapping it up this first season. There's still much more to come, but now we want to 
for our Facebook Live audience go through our parade of contributors to this series. Yes, and um, to guys like Gunbot, the train, <laughs> Zekek, Zork, Scooge, Bol <laughs> Boldabop, Boldadop, sorry, <coughs> Skyhawk. He was crazy. Dog Wine, Terra, Frosty, Dog wine. <laughs> <laughs> Body Miles, Elliot Ness, Gas Mars, Poodle, <laughs> Billy Swank, Jalati, Death, Gender, um, Shoebox, Katanga. Right, let's go to the first, um, let's go. So, so we're going by the episode. Bed. Basically, what you will see is on each slide, you will see the, the men um, who appeared on each episode. So we'll go through it with you. The first episode featured... Lennox Crow. Yes. And Kurt, um, Crow, Crow, you're going to play that bed in the background because the more we are together. This is the... Yes. Lennox Crow. The plane? Franklin yeah. Brown and Gilbert Modest. Also known as Babel. I don't know what Brown's um, nickname was or Crow's nickname, <laughs> but... Listen, let me get some of that music. This is Parade here, Crow. Crow, sorry. So more we are together. More we are together. Give them some other music. Oh, okay. This is this is the unity song for yes. for both arms. Well, all arms of the defense force really. This is this is a symbol of the unity and camaraderie among all of the arms of the defense. Right. Force. So in this picture, you would see the first episode: Lennox Crow, Franklin Brown, and of course, retired warrant officer, <laughs> uh, who I described was my father. Because, you know, he was my father. I, I, that's, that's the first time I actually met a father. My you know, father, you know, it was too, totally different to what my father offered me in life. And I'll always be grateful to him. So Gilbert Morris, and this was the crew from the first episode. I remember, we remember Franklin Brown, his famous comment <laughs> during that episode that he thought it was a movie. He thought it was a movie, <laughs> yes. When he saw the officer as it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> right, so let's go to the next slide. And episode, episode two. Yes. And of course yeah. you would have heard of from... And we're Come showing you it, Franklin. it will come up on your device in a while. Commodore Franklin. Commodore Franklin. And retired warrant officer, class one, Carlton Ramnath. And also retired fleet chief petty officer, Sidney Alexander, better known as Smiley. Smiley, yes. So the credits rolling now, folks. This is the credits here rolling. <laughs> <laughs> As yes. you would see, right. I love that picture with Smiley, though. He yeah, looks yeah. like a real sailor. I mean, the, yeah, that's a movie picture. That's yeah, a movie yeah, shot. yeah. <laughs> he's, he's leaning on the bofers there and, yes. and really looking like, you know, he's on the barrel of the bofers. A man of like. action. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> just, just waiting for that ship to cross the line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next slide. Right, so in episode two, part two yes, of... Yes, yeah, uh, episode two. two we had also contributions from... That's John Job, the man with the rifle on the left, at the, on the shoulder. The submachine gun, sorry. Um, that is him again. Receiving a commendation from the president. President. And that was that is Lou Jones and as a corporal. Lance Lance corporal. Jones. So that's Lou Jones as a Lance Corporal. So we have John Job and Lou Jones in this... In this photograph here. in the bush as he was hunting down the, yes. the freedom fighters and receiving his commendation. Part three and four. President we had Clark. Ray Admiral Richard Kelschel. Yes. And also retired Lieutenant Patrick Andre. And The Rock himself. The Rock. Colonel Wendell Salandi. Retired as left then Colonel Weldell Salandi. That's what he looks like. That's what he looked like in his kit back in the day. Mm -hmm. Right? Where you see the Coast Guard crest is because we couldn't get a picture from the gentleman. So we put up the Coast Guard um, identification at least because they work with the Coast Guard. And, that, and that's we hope they allow us capstar. permission to use this in this fashion. Yes, I hope they don't mind us. 
using it so right so um then you heard from the support you heard from the support crew from this this was the from the police the prisons yeah. the volunteers and the cadets so in, up on the on the screen you know, we have the picture of colonel Fil, um filbert my colonel commissioner, <laughs> commissioner james filbert former commissioner james filbert commissioner of police commissioner of police former um, commissioner of prison leo abraham and you remember his testimony and then we had Rex Vidali. His father was Captain Vidali. Um, he was part of the, the, man, the founder of the volunteers, actually. And of course, Neil Alexis from the Coast Guard. And Natasha, I apologize for the spelling of yes, the name. Yes, I apologize, sir. I, it, it should be spelled. His first name is N E A L. I un unfortunately use the more popular spelling, N E I L. My yes. Apologies, sir. So, all right, so that's the. Um, the gentlemen from the police prisons volunteers and cadet force they made their contribution during 1970. up next on the photo on the parade is retired staff sergeant kenneth moore you heard about his you heard his testimony He's he was part. among the the group that went over the hill he yes. followed them and over the hill to escape tetron yes and then changed his mind and give up <laughs> and he eventually went on trial with the a number yes. of other soldiers. And of course, we had Godfrey Cumberbatch. Mm -hmm. Godfrey Cumberbatch, who was the leading mechanic back then. Mm -hmm. And Kenneth Hutchinson, the man who drove Stanley Johnson to police headquarters that morning. Yes. That's the gentleman who drove him to headquarters. And all that good stuff. And all that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's his famous line. Next slide. <laughs> we had on that program with a, with a repeat of, I think it was Kel Shaw and John Joe. We had yes. supernumerary Harold Boland. Retired Staff Sergeant. He was one of the instructors as a rec when I trained as a recruit. And also retired Major General Ralph Brown. That's what Ralph Brown looked like as a Chief of Defense Staff. And we thank them for being part of this auspicious occasion as far as we're concerned. Next slide. So that's what Harold Boland looked like. Hmm. This this was the guy who was doing the um the dinner right yeah yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Tassa man who Tassa teach man. yes the yes. dinner to march by Tassa <laughs> of course then on that episode we had the next episode we had the Luke family mm -hmm. we heard from Gerard and the following Sunday we heard from Kenneth and Charlotte as they recounted their you know their journey on that morning. And once again, we want to thank them for their contribution to this series, for making it a success, Indeed. the success that it is. And again, we hope that they get the help that they need to get this out of the way. Last week you heard from, or the week before you heard from, that's episode 10. 10. Clive Nunes, Kafra Cambon, Alfred Aguito, and Jones, young P. Madera. Jones P. Madera. This is thank you very much to uh, Vin and Alec for this photograph. Yes. Of Jones P. Be before the, the microphones at 610. Yes, that's what Jones P. looked like as a youngster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I should say a cub reporter. That was a call there back then. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. indeed. Indeed. Right. Thank you for joining us, Benton and Beverly Ann, Crookshank, and all the rest, Brian Julian. Thank you very much. Fiola Rodder, thank you for your comments. Mario Gonzalez, thank you very much. Uh, the other slide would be... This is our tribute to Clyde Bailey. Clyde Bailey. The one soldier who lost his life during the mutiny. Yes. That's him, his, his regimental card, the newspaper spread of his funeral, a photo of his helmet, and a photo of him and his young wife and family. And we want to say thanks again to... His son, one of his twin sons who reached out to us when he heard his father's name being called, reached out to us and allowed us to meet with um, Mr. Bailey's father, who is still alive at 96, 97. We met with him and had a nice chat. Um, so we send all our love to the Bailey clan. And hope that Mr. Bailey continues to rest in peace. Right, so they have past commanders of the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard here lined up for you to see. Mm -hmm. So we have 
of the Peyton Jones, Mr. David, David Bloom, Bloom Mervyn Williams, and, Mr. and Jack, Jack Williams. Williams. Com uh, Commander Jack Williams. Good people that they all served their country well. Thank you, Trina Tobago Coast Guard, for the role that you played. We will always remember that. And we also always. privileged to, to interact with uh, Mr. Commodore uh, Commander Bloom's daughter, who was tuned in to our program. Yes. It's nice to meet you and, and get some background information on, on her dad and what they as a family live. Next slide. With. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Ms. Bloom for so now you have some of the other officers who contributed and bottom left is uh, Gaylord Kelchall as a young officer top left is uh, oh gosh Cold Straw yes Cold Straw and the men Cold Straw and his men yes in the middle you vessels, have yeah. the gunner himself the man who as we Fire see those bofers. Yes, who manned the bofers and gunnery sergeant, uh, they, 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 what do you call them in the regiment, but he <laughs> left hand commander, Donald Mohammed. That's mm -hmm. him uh, that's him as a young sailor up in the UK when you went to do his course. Then we have Smiley and the boys here, the S I the N um, IS. Uh, the IS squad. Oh, as it was in, known then. As it was known then, internal security squad. Mm -hmm. Um next slide. This is again the Trinity and the Colon Bay. Bay. There was two vessels. There's two famous vessels. Were involved in the firing of the hills and the reconnaissance that happened during that mutiny. This is what they looked like back in those days. Yes. And the next slide would be. The next slide is the the famous Bofors. And the cargo staff. Yes. You heard so much about these boofers and the and and you will see so you can go down to the Shagramas Museum and you will see more of these in person. Yes, yes. In real. You know, you can actually go down there and touch them and see what these you know what the photo at the bottom right is what the bofo actually looks like at the museum. That photo was yes. taken at the museum. So you can go down there and see it. And top right is the cargo staff and some of the ammunition that is used with that weapon and then also we the next slide would be the most famous person in this series and Trevor R. Farrell Sr. says thanks to you and the series I had something to break the monotony of the strange these strange COVID days I <laughs> eagerly look forward to my 6 p.m. alarm on Sundays oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm not hooked. What am I to do with my future <laughs> Sunday evenings? You can stay hooked on. <laughs> stay locked on, sir. Stay locked on. We have more things to come, man. Don't worry. Thanks oh, again. We have something new and interesting to hear on our independence. Yeah, thanks again to all involved in presenting this gift to Trinidad and Tobago. I'll we be have the commanding officers of the regiment. And, and we now have the famous Julian Spencer. And that MG. That, that famous, famous red, red car that everybody car. spoke about. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it looked like. Yes, that's what it looked like. So, you heard it drive by so many times in this series. <laughs> yes. And of course, that's his son, Anthony W.J. Phillips Spencer, who retired Brigadier General, who's now our ambassador to Washington, D.C. So, father and son making their contribution to Trinidad and Tobago. God rest his soul. Indeed. And of course, God bless. Anthony Phillips Spencer is still serving his country out there in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And of course, those famous guys, Rafik Shah, Rex LaSalle, Mike Bazzi. The starters, the mutineers. Their pictures are up Very next. Good. And if you're just joining us, folks, you, you know, you're missing a nice treat here. We're having an advance in review order, so to speak. Um, if the military wouldn't mind me using that phrase, that term. Um, of the people who contributed to this series and we thank them very much for there and also we have a support staff too for yes. those of you who uh who remember all the people who contributed who helped to make this series yes. possible gave us phone numbers yes. sent us information provided us with music yes all of these gentlemen did their part yes and we have from top left that's winston ms nurse the founder of the trinidad and tobago armed forces veterans association mm -hmm. 
he was the first person I called last year when we decided to do this. And he starts set the ball rolling. So we want to thank Mr. Nurse. Yes, Brian. Children, just go to Andy Fennessy Facebook page <laughs> and click on the live. You know how long I send that message for you? You're a slacker. All right, continue. Um, Keith Harris, <laughs> retired Chief Petty Officer. Also, Delano Henry, retired, um, well, he's yeah, still serving, okay. Chief Petty Officer. Um, also, Garnet Moore, retired Fleet Chief Petty Officer, who, who loaned us books and all of these things, and we have some things to share from him too. Um, Major Wade, remember, retired Rabbi Wade, yes. and Arthur Nunes, they provided us with me the music you're hearing in the background. Yes. And also, Alfred Aguito, um, sorry. That's Fern and Alec. and Alec. Him as a young reporter and how he looks today. 1968 and 2012, respectively. Yes. So, thank you again to all of these gentlemen for your contribution to this series. That we could not have done it without you. Couldn't have done it without you. And of course, we take some calls now. Six two two three nine two seven. Get your word in quickly because remember. Um, and again, we're going to touch on 1990. We have that in the planning. Or oh, these are my pictures. Um, Right. And you know, I wanted to tell, as Look I said, the guys who face. were complaining. Oh, yeah, that's well. That's me. Yeah. So proud I was to be a, a, a soul, young soldier. Yes. And that's me as a squad leader. That's the top right is me on the personal parade. That was he was Captain Dylan at the time, and um, and my mom. That was me as a young PTI below. And you know, um, the next PTI, I want to wake you all up with it. Look at that. After the proud moments, one wrong decision, and this is what happened to me. I want you young soldiers to understand, young soldiers, sailors, and everybody to understand that you have an opportunity to serve your country now. Don't throw it away. Let's take the first call. Hello, good evening. Hey, good afternoon, girl. Good afternoon, Tasha. Good, good evening. evening. Yes, Toronto. I had a call, call you down to tell you congratulations for all what you have done to put those um, those uh, um, events out. You know, it was, it was a good it was a good thing. I learned a lot from it, and to see and to know some I know some of the past. Um, Major General Ralph Brown, and Mr. R S M Modest and Staff Sergeant Lou Jones. Those are guys who I know very well. I'm God going to bless them. I'm God going to bless you guys. And continue, continue the program again. Good afternoon, Mr. Shah. Good afternoon. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Is this the program with God? Yes, Yes. Natasha. Yes. Yes. Okay, this is Sheldon here, God. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just just wondering is there any way that this this 10 series or 12 series, how much it is, episodes, could be passed on to to, to, to the school so that it could be taught as part of our history? Well, that'll be up to the um, that'll be up to the Ministry of Education if they would accept it, you know, um, you know. But we could try. In my opinion, they should because it is part of Trinidad's history. That's yes. It. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What? That's it. Very good. Thank you very much for the information. You're welcome. You're and welcome. anytime you want to go back to it, you can go back to our Facebook page, our Independency, and get a cup. You know, go from episode one and all of the check it out. Yes, there, all will yeah. be there. Okay. All right. Take care. Vilma Fortune, thanks. Kat and Natasha, great program. Looking forward to 1990 series. Thank mm. you, Judy Beckers. Thank you, Anna. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Anna Maguire, good evening. EOD team, great series. I'm saving this last program. Great job. What a team you both are. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Good, good evening. evening. Um, very good program, informative and educational. And I wish. You could have got some more information from some of the guys who are still alive. And they could have put in as the old people who said their two cents worth. And on that, I would like to send condolences to retired Commander Greg Walcott on the passing of his niece. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, yes. yes, same here. Okay, brother. Thank condolences. You. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gardner. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, Ambassador. Good evening. Good evening, Gardner Natasha. Good evening. Good evening. Wonderful, wonderful day. I never miss a moment every Sunday. And thanks to Rafi and all the guys who play their part and we yes. that history. 
Thank you. That you're already humble guy. Lessons to you and Natasha. Okay then. Thanks, Kathy. And Zorel. That is Lou Jones. That was Lou Jones. Zorel. Zorel. Prunes. <laughs> Master Stitch. White meat. <laughs> preka preka. <laughs> Bliss. Good evening. Preka preka. <laughs> Go look at names around. I'm not right for me here. Oh gosh. Good evening. Could write a whole book with names. Yes. Good evening. Well, brother, that was an episode when by the Europeans you know, came and All right, Manu. Thank you. All right. And the young guy, you look like you starred in an officer and a gentleman in passing. Oh, <laughs> yes. He was All so right. cute. So handsome. What are the specific recommendations from the soldiers who were disgruntled? Well, among other things, salary, better salary, better working conditions. And um, just for them to listen, you know. Uh, if you know, I appreciate the series, I will always tell young people to try and listen to this series. We need to tell our history before somebody else does it. Correct. And remember, folks, all of the videos from the entire series are all on our Facebook page. So if you yes. want to go back to any of the episodes, you can do that on Facebook. Yes. When will this be placed in a booklet students for students to know their history? Well, that will we, we will keep you updated on that perfectly. Um, and dependency always tries to, to, to remain at the and keep a standard and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Annette Maguire, for all your support. And um we can take a couple more before we go six two two three nine three seven. Um to Bone Daniel. Yeah, <laughs> Loopy Lou <laughs> Tiger Phillips um, Slapper Sweet Ken Black Willie Toy Soldier <laughs> Lord Boy yeah. Toy So that's really hard You could write a whole book on nicknames and army you know. yeah. So folks Once again Thank you all very much We're glad we brought so many people together On Facebook um, with this series we're really really happy that we did and to my brother who's worried what you're going to do with your Sunday evening we'll always have something here because remember Andy Penance is a drug demand reduction prevention program so we always have good information and especially coming up now where we heard a lot about grooming if you have grandchildren you have children young ones how you know they're being groomed 80% of the people worldwide who were groomed were not by strangers there were people that were close to them. And so next week, Sunday, we're going to have Mr. Lana Wheeler, Director of the Counter Trafficking Unit, dealing with grooming and what we should look out for. We had a lot of situations like that wherein it's ugly head in Tobago, especially. For I've never seen so many arrests for interfering, for molesting children happening so much as it has happened in the past few months coming out from Tobago. So it's something that we must deal with. And then, following which we go into 1990 and we start now we'll have to break up that thing we, um, because before school opens we plan to do a grand thing on facebook as well you'll be hearing about that coming up because we have to prepare our children for what they have to face when they go back out to school ready set grow ready set grow remember there are people who will use them to sell drugs sell marijuana brownies and cookies take opioids into the schools we have to be mindful of that and we have to warn you we'll show you on facebook what to look out for and how to deal with it also we'll share some text messages between adults and children who actually groom children 
that made it to the internet so that you can see if you check your child phone and see a conversation like that with someone you know that they're being groomed by an adult looking forward to the next week guys and tasha great job curtis cox i met mr shah during the times as head of tnt marathon committee michael Dunton. Thanks, Garth and Natasha, for this educational program and do support having this history taught at schools. Probably some of the students, parents can assist them in explaining their uncles and aunts as soldiers involved in the unrest. Right, so folks, once again, we thank you. Could, um, short man, thank you very much for your brilliant work yes yes making our facebook live right come to life literally yes, literally we thank, thank you very so much. much um kenneth we we couldn't take the call because this for this is what we doing the live on here so it going to that we're not even going to see it ring um until long afterwards so so but we'll talk afterwards right so folks natasha any parting work yes well i mean i I am happy for all of the information that we're able to share. I, I learned a lot um, during this series and I think I have a better appreciation now for the work that soldiers do, soldiers and sailors. Um, and I think a greater respect as well for the work that they do. And, you know, we, we should all be grateful for the service of the men and women who wear the colors. Yes. Yes, 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 we must. And I want to thank them too for instilling in me a trait or something that helped me to survive out here in this jungle when I was released into this jungle. It wasn't easy, but my, the military training is what kept me and what helped me to survive. I will always love the military. Always that love that institution. There is no other. Trust me. It just... I'm uh, hoping that the commanders as well would have learned something from this series. Indeed. All right, so Ke, thank, thank you, you very once much again. for joining us on Facebook and on the air. We can't forget our listeners on the good old radio. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. We hope you were entertained, informed, and enlightened. And we will be bringing much more to you uh, regarding 1990 and all of our other programming on Iron Dependency. Yes. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Altier. God bless you all. Have a good week. Be safe. Remember to still follow the rule. We're still on this mask, COVID. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Be safe. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Anna. God bless you all. Good night. Cool. Anna, it's a good evening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Good night. Good night. You're listening to I on Dependency with Garth and Natasha. Reality Radio at its best. The number one name in talk, I-9.